morning. I'm getting a really late start getting into this book. So I thought I would at least try and get a little bit done. All right, so show chapter seven. David Howard's house is twice as big as ours for about half as many people. Only him and his ma and dad. Mr. Howard works for the Tyler Star News in Sistersville. And David is David's ma as a teacher. They're always glad to have me come down to visit, partly because David and I are best friends, and partly, I think, because their house is so big, the three of them get lost in it. I don't think I have that problem. It's got two floors, three counting the basement and four counting the attic. has four bedrooms upstairs, one for David, one for his folks, one for just company, and one for his father's books with a computer in it. Downstairs, there's a big kitchen, a dining room with a fancy light hanging over the table, a parlor, and a side room with lots of windows just for plants, plus a porch that runs along three sides of the house. I think they're doing okay. I told Ma once the Howards had a room just for company and a room just for books and a room just for plants, and she said that was three rooms too many. First time I ever saw any envy in my Ma. David says this house used to belong to his great-granddaddy, so I figure it'll get to be David someday. Like maybe our little house and hill and meadow and the far woods will belong to me and Shiloh, except I'd probably have to share it with Daryl Lynn and Becky and whoever they marry. And that's a whole lot of people for four rooms. Marty, Miss Howard says when I ring their doorbell, that sounds like church chimes. We're so glad to see you. Come on in. She always means it too. It's as though she thinks about me even when I'm not there. Then David comes whooping downstairs. <laughs> whooping downstairs. Carrying the helicopter that flies when you pull a string, and pretty soon we're out in the backyard chasing around after the helicopter and telling each other what we've been doing the six weeks since school let out. I got to bite my tongue not to let on about Shiloh. We sit on David's back steps and eat popsicles his mom made out of pineapple juice. Yummy. I tell David about his fox I saw with a gray body and a red head, and he tells me about his Aunt Siamese cat that yells just for the pure joy of making noise. Then I tell him about Judd Travers and how mean he is to his dogs, not mentioning Shiloh, of course. And then David says he's got a surprise to show me. We go upstairs to his room and David says he's got a pet and I ask, do, asks, do I want to hold it? Sure, what is it? Sit down. Close your eyes and hold out your hands, says David. I sit down on the edge of his bed and close my eyes and hold out my hands. I expect something warm and wiggly and furry to plop into my arms. Instead, I feel something cold and round and plastic and when I look it's a fishbowl with sand in it and a hermit crab scurrying around with the shell on its back this is a pet I don't know that I would have put closed my eyes and just hoped whatever he was putting in my hand was not a snake my first pet David says his name is Hermie see all those shells in there we bought them for him at night he gets out of one and puts on another it's just like changing clothes I look at David and I look at that crab in a fishbowl and I want to tell him about Shiloh and how we run up and down the far side of the hill every day and roll in the grass and licks me how he licks my face and how I can't tell him anything. But I can't tell him anything. Not yet. Not ever, maybe. Hermie's sort of fun, though. We get out David's old blocks, the kind you play with back in kindergarten, and we build this big maze with walls on both sides and we put Hermie in it. He skids along the maze, looking which way to go, and we laugh when he finds himself in a dead end. I guess any kind of pet's okay once you get used to it, but I wouldn't trade Shiloh for all the hermit crabs in the world. Well, when can I come to your house, David asks me when we put the blocks away. I don't know, I tell him. Moss had this sort of headache, and she can't take any noise at all. Boy, I sure am asking for trouble with that one. We could stay out on that big hill, David suggests. Chase around in that field, play lookout. I don't think we ought to till she's feeling better. I'll let you know, but I can come down here again next week, maybe. I tell Miss Howard I got to be home by late afternoon to help out, and she says, surely I can stay for lunch, which is what I was hoping. I sit down at the table with placemats, which are little doll-sized tablecloths, under one under each plate. Mrs. Howard's made us eat a chicken salad sandwich with lettuce, tomato, and toothpicks with olives on top to hold it all together. David's ma's like that. I think because she's a teacher, always looking for ways to make something better than it is. She does the same with boys. She do, don't just leave us to eat by ourselves. My ma packs us a lunch and lets us eat it out in the woods. Miss Howard always sits down to eat with us and talks about grown-up things. She tells Today she tells us how we've got some new people elected to office who are going to be more honest, she hopes, than the people defeated. 
And that's how the country is going to be better because of it. Mm. And so will the whole state of West Virginia. David's ma. David's ma thinks big. You can't just go on electing people to government because they're your friends of your father or grandfather, she says, chewing on a bite of celery. Mostly I'm thinking about this food. I eat every bit of this chicken sandwich. I'm so hungry I don't even save some for Shiloh. And then I'm ashamed of myself. <sighs> Mrs. Howard notices the way I pick up every little crumb and she says, I've got enough chicken salad left for another half sandwich, Marty. Would you like it? Sure would taste good on that walk back home, I tell her, and she sits right to work wrapping it up for me. This is Shiloh's dinner, I tell myself. But lunch isn't over yet. After the sandwich, there's tapioca pudding, chocolate-covered graham crackers, which I almost love as much as Christmas. I don't see any way of getting that pudding to Shiloh, so I eat that, but I ask kind of take a couple of cookies along to eat on the way home, too, and she opens the sack and sticks in six cookies. Ma would have blushed with shame if she had heard me ask, but seems I'm at the point where I'll do most anything for Shiloh. A lie don't seem like a lie anymore when it's meant to save a dog, and right and wrong is all mixed up in my head. Worse than that, when I leave David's house, I don't even head home. First, I go to the, down to the street to the corner store and ask Mr. Wallace, does he have any sort of old cheese or lunch meat that he can sell me cheap? I've got 53 cents for the cans I've collected so far that Dad turned in for me, and I show Mr. Wallace how much I got. Well, Marty, let me see what I can find back here, he says, leading me to a little room behind the counter. He's sort of talking without looking at me, the way folks do when they don't want to embarrass you. I've got some stuff in here that's not exactly spoiled, but it's too old to sell. Wouldn't want your family to get sick on it, though. I blush, because then my dad would die of embarrassment if he knew what Mr. Wallace is thinking, that I'm buying this food for our supper, but there's no way in the world I can let on about Shiloh. I give him all the change I got, and he lets me have a big hunk of cheese, moldy on one side, whew, a carton of sour cream, a half a package of frankfurters that somebody opened and bought five of. I'm as happy as a flea on a dog. <laughs> happy as a flea on a dog. All right, then. That's a simile or a metaphor. What do you think? <sighs> Somehow I know without asking that Mr. Wallace isn't going to go telling folks about it because people around here tend to keep quiet out of someone else's business. Well, the next problem I got to solve, though, is how to keep all this stuff from spoiling in the July heat. I can't keep it in our refrigerator or Ma would notice right off. When I get home, Ma's ironing and watching TV and Daryl Lynn and Becky's out on the front swing with paper dolls spread out all over the place so I can fish around out in the shed till I find me an old high sea can. I sneak off the, up the hill with the can and all the food I got with me. Then with Shiloh watching, I put a rock in the bottom of the can to hold it down. Set it in the cool stream. Oh, he's smart. Surround it with rocks and put in the container of sour cream, the frankfurters, and the cheese and cookies in there. I put the plastic lid on and set a large rock on top to keep the raccoons out. I'm so proud of myself. I like the crow. I think it just means he's really happy because he did think of something kind of smart there. Hungry again, too, but that half-eaten, half-chicken salad sandwich for Mrs. Howard is Shiloh's dinner, and I give it to him right off. After that, Shiloh and me go on a long, good long run over the meadow on the far side of the hill. And after that, lost my spot. And after that, Shiloh and me go on a good long run over the meadow on the far side of the hill, and after that, I take him back, put fresh water in the pie pan, and love him good. I start down the hill, halfway to the bottom. Here comes Daryl Lynn. What are you doing up here, I ask her. My heart started to thump. I just wanted to see what you're doing, she complains. You go off up here every day almost. Will you leave Becky by herself while Ma Ma's ironing? Becky's okay, she turns and follows me back down the hill. Shiloh, up in the pen, don't make a sound. That's how smart that dog is. Well, I was looking for that snake again, but he's hiding from me good, I tell her. You still didn't get him, she asks. And when I look back at her, she's got eyes to the left and to the right. You didn't even take your snake stick, she says. Well, she's a smart one, too. Got me a stick back up on the hill, I tell her. Well, how many snakes you figure are up there, Marty? Oh, about 29 that you can see. Baby snakes all over the place, though, hiding, growing into big ones all the time. Dara's, Dara Lynn's walking faster now, hurrying to get on by me, watching every place she sets her foot. That's me, though, outside. I, I go to my dad's house and I watch where I walk because I'm always scared there's a snake somewhere. 
I don't feel good about all these lies I tell Daryl M. Or David or his ma. But I don't exactly feel bad neither. What if Grandma Preston told me once about heaven and hell and what's what if it's true? Liars go to hell. Then I guess that's where I'm heading. But she also told me that only people are allowed in heaven, not animals. And if I was to go to heaven and look down and see Shiloh left below, head on his paws, I'd run away from heaven for sure. All right. See you next time for chapter eight.